um, with the uh, pre-show show, uh, and that is um, the speaker series, as you know, we have the speaker series and then the social, the networking social afterwards with pizza uh, at around noon. And that social is sponsored, this whole quarter has been sponsored by the Next Generation IT Club. And so we want to give them a little bit of time to come up and tell you about their work. No, I didn't Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for showing up. Those of you that are new today, thank you for showing up. Giving us an opportunity to uh, educate you on our speakers. No. Um, no. So uh, we've got a couple of cool events coming up called uh, the uh, Spring Tech Fair. And it's coming up uh, in May 18th uh, at the uh, middle of next quarter. And we'll have uh, this entire room set up with uh, workstations and little projects that you can kind of get your hands on and experiment with uh, web design, networking, uh, database design, game design, and uh, placing games that uh, some of the, the student body has created. Um, we'll have a slideshow running with uh, uh, screenshots of uh, projects that uh, the student body has submitted to us. So if any of you have a, a web design project or a photo of uh, a class project that you created and you want to share that with us, you can email those to uh, our email at tngtic uh, dot cascadia at gmail.com. That's a JPEG attachment. Work those into the, the slideshow. Um, we have Linux Fest coming up um, at uh, April 28th, 29th, and 30th. No, 27th, 28th, and 29th. And uh, the rooms, the, the space in the rooms are going fast. What is Linux Fest? Linux Fest is a, uh, a Northwest uh, conference, trade show, all about open source software, the latest and greatest uh, releases of uh, Linux and other open source software. Hardware that's based on open source uh, hardware design where you can uh, uh, freely uh, share the schematics and the chips design uh, information with your friends and not worry about violating and patent right information. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a big uh, a raffle. You can win uh, all kinds of hardware and software and books and stuff. Uh, and uh, then there's a, a big uh, gaming feast um, on Saturday night where everybody can get together and network and, and catch up with uh, friends, make new friends, uh, play games. They have about three different kinds of gaming platforms set up uh, that you can play the latest and greatest games. Uh, and that's up in Bellingham at the Community College in, in Bellingham. So we get to travel up there on the, on the vans. Um, we've got uh, all the seats are filled in the van currently, but uh, if you can make it up there on your own and you let us know you want to go in time, we can have a room for you. There, you won't have to pay for your room or your while you're there, you'll have to get there and back in your own vehicle. We've got two vans full. One. What? When we only have one driver. So we don't want to take a man right. If somebody else wants to call, uh, is faculty and wants to volunteer as a driver for us, let us know. We can take two vans that can yeah. be asked to drive. When is that? Sorry, what day? What's that? What day was that? Uh, the 27th, 28th, and 29th of April. Uh, yeah, you just have to, uh, if, you're, if you're able to drive uh, for us, uh, contact Aaron uh, Tuttle over at the Student uh, Life office. And we'd appreciate it because the, the more drivers we can get, the, the more vans we can take in college vehicles we can take. So nobody has to drive in the vehicle. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Brian and Chris are speaking. I have a quick question. Okay. Sorry. Does the faculty need to stay there? Because a faculty member drive a group up and pick you up two days later? No, they have to stay. They have to be our advisor. Or I think co-advisors can stay there with us. They get their own room. They can okay. you know, get fed and stuff too. Uh huh. They have to hang out with us. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that uh, that spring tech fair. Um, the club has really been working hard to try to think about ways to make that 
uh, way of really opening up the technology programs here to other students who may have some interest in it, but don't really know what it's all about and, and might you know, learn something about it, might then that spark an interest for them and they start down this path of learning about technology. So if you can think of some, think back to when you started in this area and something that got your attention and was interesting to you. And then if you can think about a way that you could find a, a fun way to make that accessible to other people, you could even set up a little station here that day and sort of you know spend a couple hours here, you know, encouraging people to try this little website design or you know put together this little program or a little JavaScript program online that you know did something and you see those light bulbs go on as people realize, oh my gosh, you know, I see this stuff all the time, but I can really do it. And it can be really fun to, to kind of put that together and move move into that place of encouraging someone else like you've been encouraged in your process. That feels really good, too. So think on that. Just connect with the club. Uh, they're working hard on getting that all, the structure of it scheduled and set, so you can just step in and do that one little piece and make a, make a real contribution. Well, with that, um, Really excited to introduce our speaker today and to um, hear what uh, Neil has to say. So Neil Evans is joining us from Microvision today. <laughs> so Neil has been in the industry since here for over 18 years, uh, working in this uh, field in um, IT management and at that senior and executive uh, management level, uh, CIO level, Chief Information Officer. Um, says here at Microsoft, Real Networks, and at BCC, Bellevue Community College. So some you know, amazing experience that he's going to be sharing with us today. And he's currently working at Microvision uh, as uh, their CIO, or the, effectively that. And uh, just a short uh, information about that, uh, a former student here, uh, Matt Carmine, I don't know if you ever ran into Matt there, but he worked at Microvision for a number of years, got his um, his uh, degree here in uh, web programming, then went to uh, UW Bothell and got a CSS degree there. And took both of those and went up to Microvision and worked there for a number of years. Uh, really had a, a very successful time there. He's so moved on from there now into the next part of his journey, but uh, he, he has had a great experience there. And it was really, uh, really a wonderful transition. The IT field. So, with that, we'll welcome me all. Okay, I hope you can use the uh, microphone if you can. Can you hear me better? It's up. Yeah. Oh, we, if we shut that door. Well, I don't want to be. So I may have a wireless. Yeah, wireless. So we already have some technical problems. And when I say this presentation, I say that on network drive, um, which is usually a good idea because there's a backup of it, but we have to say it locally, so we had to. Email to me this morning, but I think we're good now. Okay. I, I'm just going to have to talk about it. Okay. So, um, thanks for having me speak today. Um, this is actually one of the best times in, in, in history to be an IT professional because technology is having such a dramatic effect on our culture and our society. Um, we're in a, entering a period where technology has the potential to solve some of the uh, world's um, most pressing problems, including uh, things like uh, overpopulation, food, water, energy, education, and commerce. It's, it's no coincidence that Bill Gates went from um, you know, heading the world's largest software company to heading the world's largest private foundation. And he's addressing a lot of these pressing issues. He went through this confirmation, uh, even when I was at Microsoft, where um, you know he, he was really into technology and thought technology was going to change, you know, have a huge impact across the world. But he went on this safari kind of to Africa, and he saw how people that you know didn't even have clean water and, and things like that, um, and it really had a big impact. And that it was his impetus to start the foundation. And now they're addressing some of the things global health global development issues uh, around the world, but applying technology uh, to those problems. So today I'm going to talk about 
What are some of these major trends in technology, and what impact are they having on IT careers? I'm calling this uh, bigger trends in IT preparing for next generation IT careers. I just put this together this week, so I have no practice on it. I'm going to have to look my notes a lot, so just be forgiving. Um, I have about 20 some slides. It'll take about 20, 25 minutes. Save your questions till the end. And we'll have about 20 minutes for that. So what's driving these, these 10 gigatrons uh, in technology? Well, it's these uh, four laws of technology. And when I'm done, I will um, you know, email this to Brian and he can distribute it uh, for you. Great, thank you. Have a copy. So we all know about Moore's Law, uh, going to from Intel in the early 1970s, after they invented the microprocessor, um, came up with this, what now called Moore's Law, that uh, in essence, computing power doubles every 18 months. He, he said in terms of transistors, but the effect of it is that computing power at the same price is, is uh, doubling every 18 months. George Gilder, who's a tech writer, author, came up with what's now called Gilder's Law of Information Networks. That network bandwidth is tripling every 12 to 18 months. So you get more and more bandwidth for the same price, um, you know, using fiber, and then uh, the same things are happening in wireless. Google's Law of Information Content is that information content is quadrupling, quadrupling every uh, 12 months. And here's some interesting stats. If you took all the uh, human history uh, from the beginning till 2003, all of that data would, would uh, add up to five exabytes. An exabyte is 10 to the 18 bytes. So five exabytes from, you know, for 7,000 years from, uh, say, 5,000 5, BC till, till now. Then from 2000, no, I'm sorry, to 2000. Three. So 2003, 2010, we were creating uh, five exabytes every two days. And now, this year, we're creating five exabytes of data every 10 minutes. So huge amounts of data are being created. And that's why I say information content is growing at this uh, exponential level. And then lastly, Zuckerberg, uh, named after Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, Law of Information Sharing. He says, the amount of information shared digitally doubles every 12 months. So people, uh, you know, this is being shared personally, commercially, and institutionally. Um, and that's what's driving, you know, the success of social networks like Facebook. So the first trend I want to talk about is consumeriz consumerization of IT. This is a real big one having a big impact on IT organizations because now, you know, the, the, the employee, the consumer is king that employees are setting standards for mobile devices within organizations, and IT is having to adapt to that. It used to be the opposite. IT would set standards, and everyone would have to adapt to that. You know, we're going to buy just IBM PCs, we're going to run only this version of Windows. And now, because uh, somewhere, uh, I'd say somewhere in the, uh, if you look at Google, I mean at Apple, somewhere in the last like five years, um, Consumer technology, the spending on consumer technology exceeded that on, on, on business technology. And that consumers were actually creating the standards and companies like Apple were leading uh, in terms of technology use of use. And so people brought those things to work and they said, well, why can't I use these? And why can't it be just as easy at, at work as it is at home? So this is called BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, the expectation is that work computing should be just as easy as home computing. And therefore, uh, like in our organization, when I first came uh, there about uh, three and a half years ago, all we supported was, you know, I was uh, Windows machines. And now we support Windows, Android, iOS, and Linux. So multi-platform is, is going to be standard across all organizations. Uh, the next one is the commoditization of IT infrastructure. This, uh, this man, Nicholas Carr, he's at Harvard. Uh, wrote this book called The Big Switch. And he said that the digital revolution is a lot like what happened with electrification around 100 years ago. First it started out that uh, companies would have their own power plants and they'd be located near uh, you know, windmills and water wheels and they would generate their own power. And then somewhere in the early 1900s, they became uh, a utility to generate power and everybody would just plug into that. And so we kind of see the same thing happening now with, with cloud computing is that these cloud providers are providing the utility of computing and there's no reason for companies to buy their own. I mean, there's some reasons, but 
Um, it, a lot of it's going to affect transitioning to the cloud because it's just more cost effective. And I'll talk, well, here's why. Uh, economies of scale. Uh, you know, companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Amazon can buy and run technology farms, you know, server farms, much cheaper than any company can do that. Uh, elasticity of, of supply. So instead of buying a whole bunch of supply because you have, say, say you're a company like, well, Amazon's not a good example, but if you're a company that has big sales uh, at, in the fourth quarter before at Christmas, so you're a consumer company, you're going to, you want to staff up for that. You want to have enough technology available for that. More, more computers, more uh, transaction processing. So you'd have to buy more computing than you would use for the other uh, three quarters of the year. Well, with, uh, with cloud computing, you can just use as much as, you know, you buy as much as you use. So it, it's elastic. It goes up and down as you need it. And lastly, uh, it's very scalable. So uh, most startups now are using cloud computing instead of buying their own infrastructure. A whole bunch of startups, a whole bunch of uh, internet companies use Amazon, for example. Uh, and when Amazon had some couple of failures uh, last year, uh, and those websites went down. Things like I think Yelp and uh, Foursquare and some of these, these you know, pretty big uh, e-commerce sites um, depend upon uh, an infrastructure that that's there all the time, like utility. So they're still working things out. I mean. Companies like uh, Alaska Airlines had a big failure last year. Amazon had a, a, a big failure. A big failure means one day of downtime. I mean, because they design these things, they have total redundancy, total high availability. They should not fail at all, but, but they do occasionally. Next one I want to talk about is most of what's called big data. So much data is being generated. I talked about that. Um, here, here's an interesting stat about, uh, I'm actually involved in the film and, and video industry, I'm a uh, independent filmmaker, and if you took all of the, uh, the content that, the, you know, the pre-broadcast TV, uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS, if you took all their content, the video content that they create from the beginning of TV, around 1950, all the way till now, so it's like 60 years, um, that oh, amount of, of, of Video, uh, YouTube is generating every every two days. So every two days, uh, YouTube is generating as much video content as the three networks for the last 60 years. So lots of stuff. It's not all good. <laughs> quality is, is questionable, but the volume is definitely, definitely there. Uh, so what does it mean for companies? Well, for, here's one big thing: is unstructured data is growing 80% here. So. IT is used to structured data that comes from their business systems, that comes from uh, spreadsheets, things like that. Well, look, a lot of this data now isn't structured. It's, it's video content, it's from um, social networks, it's from email. So there's a whole bunch of, you know, how do I make use of, how do I store it, how do I make use of that information? There's a strong link between uh, effective data management and company and their, their financial performance. And this has created a whole industry called BI or BIA. Uh, business uh, intelligence and, and analytics. So that's a whole new field that's opening up. How do we make sense of all the data that's being generated? The next one is uh, the rise of social media. Well, we all know about that. Uh, and again, this is something that started in the in the consumer or in the personal side, and now it's completely, you know, uh, it's being, you know, Facebook is you know, being funded now by ads. And so it's you know it's become very essential for companies to have a social presence, and so they're blurring the line between personal and commercial. Like some companies, you know, say, well, you, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't go on your personal, you, know, you shouldn't go on your Facebook while you're at work. But most companies say, no, that's okay because you know we realize that part of your uh, personal resource is to you know is to have a social uh, context, and then companies are more and more uh, experiencing having to have a presence on these social media, a blurring between real and virtual self, uh, uh, the diet. So traditionally, ads have been pushed out to consumers. Now with, with social media, there's a dialogue. A company can develop a dialogue with their customers and find out how do the customers like this stuff. You know, uh, Starbucks makes really good use. Uh, every time they're going to introduce a new product or, or create a new name for a product, uh, or actually, uh, uh, Toyota did this thing where they they have multiple uh, versions of, of Prius now. 
you know, there's the original, and now there's the V, and there's the plug-in hybrid. So they said, what do you call multiple Prius? Is, should we call them pre i Should we call them Priuses? So they had all the contests, and then they, everybody voted, and they picked one of them, I think they call them Priuses. Um, and so this is where our companies are having a dialogue with, with, their, with their customers. And what this is called, the people within the company that represent the customer and understand the customer, we call that voice of the customer. Um, the market uh, technique of capturing customers' expectations, preferences, and aversions, and that somebody within the company, usually within customer service, is the voice of the customer uh, in all the discussions that happen inside a company. Like, what would, what would, the, what would our customers say about that? The next one is mobility, which is, again, these are called gigatrends trends because these four or five trends are the ones driving uh, technology completely. And it may be hard to interpret this, but what it says is we're already in the post-PC era. You know, more mobile devices are connected to the internet than PCs. So, uh, this, this happened last year, and one of those charts shows that. The, the yellow ones are, are uh, mobile devices, and the green ones are PCs. So we're already in the post-PC era. Um, when Apple, uh, Apple had, uh, announced yesterday they, they uh, announced the iPad 3, they said that in 2011, they shipped more iOS devices than any PC competitor. So it's a, uh, HP or Lenovo or any of them, Apple shipped more uh, mobile devices, which means either iPads, iPods, or, uh, <coughs> or uh, iPhones, than any of the personal computer uh, companies. This year, there's already 4 billion uh, mobile devices connected to the internet, and by 2020, there'll be 10 billion. If you look back 10 years ago, 90% of the, the devices connected to the internet ran Windows. Now, uh, more than half run other, other things, either Android or iOS. This is a big challenge for Microsoft. The next one um, is a big trend within IT called software as a service. And here are the benefits of software as a service. Uh, and again, this is sort of versus on-premise software, which traditionally companies have bought software, run it on their own servers, and if you buy it as a uh, as a capital expense, and you uh, run it yourself, and you have to do all these upgrades, and it's really complicated. But now that there's software as a service, and in my company, we were, about 80% of what we run is, is hosted somewhere else. And so the benefits are, you only pay for the number of users that you have. Like we're, we're using Microsoft CRM 2011 online, and we have 24 users. And if we have more users, we can, you know, it's per user per month, you know, this many dollars per user per month. So it's very well, you don't have to buy a big one that has 100 users, and then only have 24 of them. The next one is, uh, the CFO likes this because it's, it's an operating expense, not a capital expense. A monthly subscription. The upgradability, this is huge. When companies uh, come out with new versions, to upgrade internal software, on-premise software, is a huge problem. Whereas if you're hosted, they upgrade for you and you don't even notice that happen. So that's a big advantage for IT people. And uh, like our CRM is for our salespeople. And our salespeople are all over the world. They don't have to come back to our data center to get information. Uh, the Microsoft CRM online is posted any, you know, several places in the world, and they uh, can get to it from a browser anywhere in the world. The next one, the next one is about collaboration within an organization, which is traditionally called an intranet. Intranet, and an intranet is you know, the the web services available to a company for the employees, and it's composed of. You know, three different things. The people, all the people who contribute and then use the intranet. It's a process of governing what goes on the intranet and what are the standards, what are the policies, and how it is the basic way that um, management shares information with employees and also employees share information with, with each other. It's sort of social networking within an organization. And the technology can usually involve some kind of content management system. We use SharePoint. Um, it has blogs, forums, web parts, um, and like I said, we use SharePoint, but there are a whole bunch of open source ones that run on Linux. So this is a huge trend, is, is setting up social networking essentially uh, for, for work uh, among the employees. And also, 
the secondary benefit, like we, we have uh, engineers who work on projects, so we have uh, project management on our intranet. So that's just a way for engineers to collaborate with each other on new products. Do we have to finish the talk or could we? No, no, we can. Okay. Um, the next one, virtualization. This is a huge one. Again, uh, about the first five of these that I talked about were more like, how does it affect the user? How does it affect the consumer? How does it affect the customer? The rest of these are more like, how does it affect the back office of running IT? Virtual, uh, virtualization has had a huge impact on IT um, infrastructure. Essentially, it means mapping physical devices to virtual devices, what they call p <coughs> It means that um, you, uh, you, you, we, we started with about 50 servers, and now we have virtualized down to about 10 servers, 10 physical servers, and then we have about 70 virtual uh, machines running on each of those servers. Uh, you can virtualize not only servers, you can virtualize DRAM, uh, storage, networks. Everything can be virtualized so that if something fails, um, so efficient resource management, reduce footprint, fail over. So if you have virtual um, mapping of, say, storage or uh, networks, when one fails, you can automatically fail over to another one that, that's there as, as a backup or as a load share. Um, because it's not mapped to physical devices anymore, it's mapped to a virtual neighborhood device. And very efficient for, like, for example, we have on, on one, let's say, um, server cluster, we can actually move that RAM around if one, uh, one application needs more RAM, because more people are on it because it's the end of the month and they're running you know, reports, we can uh, dynamically move more RAM to, their, to, to service those customers. So virtualization is having a, a really great impact on both reducing the footprint of servers and also, um, you know, uh, managing the resources of, of servers, networks, and all, all the other uh, sort of data center resources. Next one is cloud backup. This is sort of a newer one. We're just kind of getting into it. Most, most companies don't do it yet, but it's great for a, a small to medium-sized company. Um, it blurs the line between your backup and your DR. What it means is you're doing just this backups over the over the internet, over the cloud, to a, a cloud service like Amazon, or there's actually companies that just do this, uh, that do just for um, just this uh, or storage backup, like um, Iron Mountain that, that traditionally did tapes. Now they're doing cloud backup uh, over the network. And it also offers DR because all your stuff is being stored at a second site now. If something happens to your site, you can you can come back and you know you can restore things pretty quickly because all your data is stored at a second site. And the last one, green IT. Uh, I see that you guys have a program in sustainable uh, environmental technology. So this is becoming really important because of the the cost of running IT. Sustainability is important. Energy efficiency. Uh, consolidation of servers we talked about, and cloud services. So um, uh, most of the companies providing cloud services are locating them, in the, you know, in like in the Northwest where there's, uh, especially Eastern Washington, uh, where there's uh, low cost power. So uh, for example, Microsoft, Yahoo, S, uh, Intuit, and Sabi have all uh, opened data centers in Central Washington to build large data centers for servers, for cloud servers, uh, because of the low cost of, uh, of energy in, in that region. It also provides great jobs in that area. Okay, so um, it, talk a little bit about the evolution of computing. Most people don't realize that there was computing before there was the, you know, the personal computer or before there was the iPhone. But really, <laughs> computing goes back to all the way to the 1940s and there's been like, we're sort of in the fifth generation now of computing. You know, we started with mainframes and, and IBM was dominant and, and still, is still around. Many computers, Hewlett Packard, Oracle, uh, Hewlett Packard is the only one that's still around. Uh, well, IBM and Hewlett Packard. In the PC uh, generation, local layer networks, Microsoft uh, was dominant in PC makers like Dell. Uh, Gen 4, uh, which is say from the 1990s to early 2000, um, is the first generation of internet companies like Google and the stuff that Apple's done. Um, and then the, the current generation, we'll call Internet 2, is the social networks uh, dominant companies are like Facebook, Twitter, um, these companies. And so what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, that most companies don't make the transition very well. The, the only one that's made the transition to all these is, you know, is IBM. 
Hewlett Packard still around in the fourth, you know, four generation platform, platform changes. Microsoft's still around, but Microsoft has major threats um, because they're still, they haven't really adapted well to Internet 1 or Internet 2.0. So um, these platforms, and they're accelerating because you know, uh, Gen 1 lasted 30 years, Gen 2 lasted 20 years, uh, Gen 3 lasted 50 years. So each of these are shorter and shorter periods of, of change and of platform change. And these companies have to be very quick to adapt, otherwise they won't make it to the next generation. So, so I've worked in business, I worked at Microsoft, I worked in education, I worked at college, and I've worked um, doing consulting for government in IT, uh, strategic planning. So this is a picture about, okay, technology changes at this exponential rate, but how do organizations adapt to this, and, and what's their rate of adoption of, of new technology? So this is my, my kind of version of it, is that technology changing at this very exponential rate, but uh, you know, even business can only adapt at a much slower rate education a lower rate, government is what even slower than that. And the ability to, to adopt technology is based on three factors. First one is what's the competitive landscape. So for, for a lot of education and a lot of government, there's no competitors. You know, like the city of Redmond, that no competition. Well, it has competition in the sense that Bellevue can steal some of their companies, but you know, you understand what I'm saying? The citizens have no choice, they have to get service from their from their government. Um, at Valley College, we used to think we were like kind of a local uh, monopoly. You know, within 20 miles, you know, most of our students came to us within 20 miles. But now with virtual education, online education, all of a sudden there's more competition for students. And, um, another factor is the financial resources. And this is kind of uh, why business can change faster. They have the resources to change faster and to invest in technology. And then lastly is the willingness of the employees to change. Um, and this again, you know, business employees for, for survival reasons, they have to change. Education, more competition, uh, and education has to adapt more. As companies like uh, University of Phoenix are stealing you know, students from traditional uh, educational organizations. And then there's government, which is really slow to change because again, they're, they're kind of this monopoly and they've never had to compete. So they go, well, why should we change? But it's starting to happen. Like, um, you know, what started in, in business 20 years ago, so this, uh, this idea of um, uh, e, uh, I'll call it, uh, so e-commerce started about 20 years ago in business. And then in education, online education started about 10, 10 15 years ago. So this is uh, being able to adapt to the way the company wants to, you know, to service. And uh, the biggest trend in government right now is e-government, being able to offer the citizens everything that you can get by going to City Hall, you should be able to get online. This is only happening right now, whereas it happened you know, 20 years ago in business. So each of these organization sectors uh, adapt differently. So what's the impact on IT careers? Well, um, companies have to focus uh, more on what their core competencies are and outsource everything else. And everything else can include IT, it can include finance, it can include HR, it can include facilities. So um, IT careers are changing. They're not always just within companies, though. They're now they're provided by third parties. Um, so, uh, IT must be business partners first, technologists second. So the question then is, how do you make yourself indispensable? Because you don't want to be outsourced. Um, well, if you're, if you're in a company, you don't want to be outsourced. Uh, but if you're in the outsourced, you know, if you're the outsourced provider, then that's okay. But so things you, you can do, build really strong working relationships with your customers, your internal customers. Learn your business better than anybody else. Because people in India and in the Philippines, they will never understand your business the way, the way you do. And uh, lastly, you know, support the really essential parts of a company, like the product development, like engineering, like sales, like service. You shouldn't be more than one step away from customer. So that means either you know, customer service or sales, or providing support to them, or providing the products or services that your company delivers. The closer you can stay to your customer, the more essential you are to an organization. Where, where's the growth in IT careers? Uh, project and program management. If, if you look uh, online, uh, there's millions of jobs that are in project management. That's a growth, growth area. Um, and then even within a company, say you outsource a bunch of stuff, uh, 
you still have to have some, somebody within the company managing the outsourcer, managing the vendor. So there's a big opportunity to manage the service providers from within a company. Uh, then there's the actual companies doing, providing the outsourced service, contracted or outsourced IT. That's probably the fastest growing part of IT, as companies try to just uh, slim down to their core competence and then outsource other things. And then within IT itself, uh, the growth areas are environmental and healthcare. So those are the two big ones that are growing, while the rest of uh, IT is, is switching mainly from internal to outsourced uh, or third party uh, uh, providing. I'm almost done, one or two more slides. Choosing IT career path. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, all IT is, is teamwork. There's no individuals, that you, there's very little that gets done one person within an organization, IT. Uh, everybody works on, on, on teams. And then you have a choice between individual contributors track or the people track. As an individual contributor, there's technical track or business track. As a people manager, there's departmental managers and then there's project managers. So all of these are kind of different tracks uh, that a person can take depending upon what they like to do and what their skill set is. Education, um, we like to say that you know, education means learning the principles and concepts within, or within a field that don't change over time very much. Whereas training is, and most of the professional certifications are about training, learning about a certain product um, that's very product specific or company specific. Hopefully, uh, in, you know, in higher education, we teach the education, the, the, the principles and concepts. So academic credentials are very important. And then supplementary, complementary to that are professional certifications. Associate degree versus a bachelor's degree. Well, when we sort of first started uh, IT programs at, at Melody College, like in the uh, mid-1990s, uh, there was so much of the IT work that their uh, associate degree was, was adequate. Then when they went through the bus, the, the IT kind of, uh, and the dot-com bus, all of a sudden they wanted bachelor's degree plus experience. Um, I would say right now, you know, uh, if you, you know, get your science degree and then, and then have to work for a company and then have them pay for getting your bachelor's degree. Uh, but bachelor's is becoming, becoming kind of a minimum standard a lot in, in technology careers. And then advanced, uh, advanced degrees in, in fields like software engineering, uh, you know, search engine op optimization, things like that. Big big data analysis. Um, all those are take more advanced to do. All projects employed. So this is a project that actually I, I was on. Uh, it's putting in some new uh, business development system. And so uh, we had an executive sponsor. We had an engagement manager. We had, and all of these different departments were part of the project. So we had business development, we had sales and marketing, we had engineering, we had legal, we had finance, and we had uh, the IT group. And then we also had outside, an outside uh, organization called Solid Computing. So almost all projects are, are cross-functional across the company. Um, so this is something that you, know, you have to learn more about your, how your organization works. But one of the big advantages of IT is being able to see across the organization. It's one of the few parts of the company that actually works with every part of the organization. Uh, User-centric design. So when, so we use this even when we're taking software and software, like we use MSCRM as our base and then customized it to business development. But it still goes through this process of, you know, we did rapid prototyping so that the users can see what they're going to get very, you know, every week. Uh, we use Agile as a design and build strategy, frequent interaction with the stakeholders, <coughs> and then delivering uh, every week we have some deliverable that people can use and try out and tell us what they thought. So this is my summary. Uh, you know, critical success factors for IT careers. It's not just technology. It's, it's about people, <laughs> the people in your organization, um, how well they work together. It's about business processes. You can't automate a chaotic process. Uh, they'll just create more chaos faster. <laughs> a lot of companies don't understand this. You have to have, you know, at least a well-defined, repeatable business practices, and hopefully work toward best practices, and then technology aligned with the business processes. Um, and that's, that's all I've got. Questions and answers. That's an amazing, rich uh, presentation. Let's see what questions that uh, generated.
Yeah. Um, have you heard the term uh, the Internet 3.0? No, I haven't heard that yet, but I'm sure somebody's trying to develop it. Um, what, what do you think it means? Well, I, I saw it in, the, in an article, and it was basically the, the creation of uh, local search through like the Google Maps, uh, having videos on your website, and then integrating with the SMS text messaging. It's supposed to be the like the next thing. I don't know if you've heard about that or it's just well, somebody I mean, trying to make it's it. Logical. There, there definitely will be Internet 3.0. I, I just don't know exactly what it is yet. I mean, of all these big trends, like what they call so low, low, social, low, low, low. So local is sort of the latest one um, because everybody's trying to do the advertising um, to, to local, you know, when you're on looking for a restaurant, you don't care about New York, you care about Redmond or, or Buffalo. So uh, I would say it's definitely a trend. I don't think the uh, Internet 3.0 is well defined yet. Yes. Um, when you move to an external host or, you know, whether that's conventional or cloud, um, even though they may have their own dependency within their own systems, uh, because you're using a single vendor, you're creating essentially a single point of failure. And I'm wondering how you feel about the risk management to that versus the internal risk management of hosting everything over. Okay, that's a, that's a good point, because as we all know, a network is only as strong as the weakest link, and, and the slow, as fast as, as the slowest link. So usually, the, when any vendor that's going to provide a cloud server or a hosted service is going to have some redundancy. They're usually they'll have multiple sites, so they have multiple paths to, to provide you. Uh, they'll have all kinds of redundancy even within the one path of uh, you know, failover, load sharing, all those kind of things. And our network, uh, our ISP, our network service provider, provides multiple paths out so that, and, and if we if we were bigger and had more money, we would have two internet service providers. So if one did fail, um, we, we, we would fail over to the other one. But we do it through just by having multiple uh, paths through our ISP um, so that we have no single point of failure. Those single, you know, we get all of our internet through a fiber. The only way that's gonna go down is if uh, a backhoe goes and takes it up, which does happen sometimes. Um, but, you know, in the three and a half years I've been there, we haven't had any outages of our service provider. So I'd say it's low probability, but you want your cloud provider to have lots of reasons. Would you ever consider using multiple vendors for your cloud providers? And you provide vendor well, you certainly could, but um, you know, there, there's a point where you, every time you add another vendor, you add overhead because you have to manage that vendor. I mean, if, just because you outsource something doesn't mean you have to manage it anymore. You have to manage the vendor to, to what are uh, called um, uh, SLA, service level agreement. You, know, you have a service level agreement, what they're going to perform. You have to manage them to that, to that level. Um, so I would say at our size, but you know, even looking at you know, when, when Amazon had these problems and these websites went down, they probably thought a lot about maybe we should have more than one hosting our, our service. So I would say if, you're, if, you're, if your business is being uh, you know, provided over the internet, like, like uh, Yelp or um, uh, you know, one of, or Twitter or any of those, you probably want to have more than one cloud provider because uh, that is 100%. You know, our business is, you know, we have an e we have e commerce on our website, but it's like 20% of our business. If it's 100% of your business, then you should have you should have multiple vendors, cloud vendors. Yeah. Oh. Me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I wondered if you you talked about some of the sort of broad career trends. I wondered if you can talk maybe a little bit uh, more specifically about people who are transitioning. You know, a lot of our students here are looking, if not right now, the near term and transitioning into um, IT employment and advice that you might give them or, or key things they should be thinking about now in order to make that transition. Sure, okay, so I assume that you had other careers and now you're making a transition to an IT career. So, you know, leverage what you know. Um, if you, and again, like I showed, people, business processes, and technology. You've already worked with people. So, you know, maximize what you've learned about working in groups, working in teams, working with <coughs> managing people on projects. Um, you know, you leverage the experience you have uh, because that's just as important as whatever technology you're learning. Technology is a tool to get things done, but it has to get done through people, and it has to get done using business process. All, all a computer system does is automate a, a manual process. And so, 
you already have experience doing two at least two thirds of those things. You know, you, you had business processes before, you worked with people before on teams. Um, you're, what you're learning is how to apply technology to those problems. So again, you know, maximize what are your skills you already have, and then leverage that into a career. Again, pro project and program management is probably the biggest growth area because IT is essentially two things. It's maintenance on what's running, and it's projects to develop new stuff. So, and the better you run your your core, you know, your your core um, technology, the more time resources you have to do new things. You know, and that's why that's another big impetus to upgrade and to stay with new technology because nobody wants to be supporting these legacy systems that are really old and don't really match your business process anymore. So, um, yeah, yes. Uh, what does Microvision do? Uh, we develop uh, uh, what's called PICO projectors, uh, PICO projector uh, technology. So uh, our first generation product was uh, a projector about the size of a cell phone that allows you to do something what this does just on a really small scale. Um, you can share information with uh, three or four or five people, and it leaves lasers to do that, and what that provides is what's called infinite focus. So it's always in focus. You can shine it on a wall, you can shine it on, actually on me, and you'd still be able to read it. Uh, so, uh, and now our second generation is actually building the chips, or the engines, we call them Pico display engines, to embed into other people's products, like cell phones, cameras, video cameras, things like that. Yes? Um, is the is Texas in terms of a competitor or a, a uh, uh, competitor? Okay. Yeah, so they have, Texas Instruments does what we do using the LP, so we use lasers. And there's another company, there are other companies like uh, like um, 3M that use what's called Elcos, LCOS. Um, so there's multiple ways of doing what we do, and we're the only ones, we're sort of the leaders in using uh, lasers to do this projection. Yes? Have you got that three color laser thing going on? Yes. Cool. Yeah, so we use uh, uh, red, green, and blue lasers. And the, so the struggle for us has been getting our costs a bit so low. Uh, red lasers came first because of CDs. So uh, CDs use red lasers to read the CDs. So the price went from $100 to like, you know, now you can get up to 5 to $10 each for, for the quality of lasers we want for red. Same thing happened with blue because of Blu-ray players. So now, you know, it started out at $120 for a Blu-ray, for a blue laser. Now it's like 5 to $10. Green lasers are the latest ones, and they're just coming into. Um, we had to do. We had first, our first generation had to use uh, what are called synthetic green lasers, and they cost us like over hundred dollars. So that added a huge cost to our product because the final product, when somebody wants to buy a Pico projector, is about two hundred and fifty dollars. So you know, the hundred half of that cost is just the one green laser. But this next generation of um, of true green lasers, we call direct green lasers, are just coming out uh, of companies um, like, um, well, the company, I can't think of that. But, um, so th there's about uh, three or four companies in Germany and in the US that are making, and in, in Japan, that are making green lasers, and they're starting off at about 70 some dollars, and they open within a year, they're getting down to, Ten or ten or twelve dollars, and you need uh, red, green, and blue to make the full color spectrum. Yes. Uh, you're saying green lasers. Are we going to start having green ray DVD players now? Well, <laughs> um, I tell you uh, a, a trend. Like I, I sometimes uh, use uh, firearms, you know, and uh, or, or traditionally the first generation of uh, optical sights were red dot or red laser uh, sights. But all the newest generation ones not coming out of green because green is uh, is brighter uh, in daylight and it's uh, it's like 50 times brighter in daylight, easier for your eye to see, and it uh, it just has a bunch of energy over red. So yeah, I, I would say there'll be a new generation of products coming out using green lasers. Yes. Another laser question. Uh, what's your uh, luminosity? Goal yeah. Eventually? Oh. LED, yeah. LED, LED. Laser, LCD, they're all kind of 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, our goal would be to have um, about a uh, 50 lumen uh, people display engine. And so 50 it doesn't sound like much, but this is probably like 1,200 lumens. Um, but 50 lumens will display amply in the ambient light like this and, and allow three or four or five people to share information. So that, we're not trying to be room projectors. We're just trying to be like, OK, like, you know, I have an iPhone, so I take all these cool photos, but it's, and I can share it with you, I can hand my iPhone, but I can't really share it with too many people. So it, it's, we think it's going to be both consumer driven by sharing photos and videos, or uh, driven by business people who do presentations, and they don't have to carry one of those big things around. They can just carry this, and they do presentations for part of their customers. Um, so we think that's the application. 50 lumens would get us to where we need to be. Yes. Um, would your um, Pico display be able to be used uh, like for a dash mounted mobile device with uh, like navigation information? Would it do a heads up display? Yes. Yeah, we, we, we're working on a heads up display with Ford Motor Company. Cool. Yeah, HUD is one of the big applications for what we do that uh, we do a lot better than uh, uh, VLP or LED or LED. I have one more. Um, you mentioned that kind of uh, intersection between the IT and the uh, environmental practices and sustainability. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, because we have both programs here, and so we're looking at ways that students can can kind of leverage both of that work. You know, do have a focus in IT or ETSP, we call it, but then do cross functional teams that can work on projects uh, in both of those areas. Well, so, you know, once companies started building server farms, they realized it was generating a huge amount of heat, so they had a huge amount of air conditioning, and it was using a whole bunch of electricity. And so that's what, that really was the impetus to start cloud computing was why can't we centralize this software as a utility? So I would say the way companies are becoming more green is by moving their stuff to the